Hello, BBCers. Welcome to another episode, episode 133. Hope you all started the season nice and well, well rested as well, right? You had the preseason, we had Christmas, New Year's. Let's start today's episode by talking a little bit about our initial thoughts of our seasons, right? The first couple, first week season of ranked? Season 13. Started, starting to get into ranked here. So you... Um, were saying on the podcast before that, you know, I think in the preseason that you were going to do the classic, have your one day of one or two days of just spamming, get that out of your system. Yep. People were trying to dissuade you to not do that in the comments. You, you did that. So walk us through what your first two weeks or so have been in the solo queue season so far. So first three days, the way I describe it, I was in like some vortex of, cause I haven't spammed games for a year, you know, since the last... Since the last, last started last season. Yeah, and I, I think I'm just too old for this, Curtis, dude. Yep. That's, that's my conclusion. And then, yeah, <laughs> then we just got we just got back into it, back to the process. Just Three blocks. Ch chipping away. Um, I'm currently rank 54. You're rank 32. And, yeah, it's pretty cruisy at the moment. I'm learning Malachi so for your, my your, guide. So your, your pool right now, Rek'Sai, Vi, you yeah. obviously finished the Vi guide, which was great. And then you're learning Maokai for the Maokai guide. So you're playing basically those three champs. Rek'Sai, Vi, Maokai. Yeah. And, uh, wait, there's another champion in there. I forgot. What's the other champion? Oh, Jarvan. I'd sprinkle and a bit of, sprinkle a bit of Jarvan. Yeah. So you've got a, basically a champ sprinkle. of four at the moment. Yeah. Um, and the Maokai one's really interesting. So a lot of people might notice Maokai is really strong right now. Uh, right as talking about that they are... Um, nerfing demonic embrace for early game champions yep. so this is for champions like the idea was that you rush it first and then i think proxon said it's been sleep ropey for a while and this is on champs like zach um diana and yeah. now malachi picked it up yep. and then so he's gonna get nerfed demonic brace malachi and his actual champion's gonna get nerfed okay. as well so it's so gonna be a double whammy it's a double whammy nerf yep. so I'm going to have to hold out on my guide for a little bit because I want to make sure my guide's like evergreen for the year. Um, so we'll get those nerfs in and then we'll see how the play style changes because currently the LPL actually brought out the Chinese league of the Demonic into Leandris. People were playing before Phase Rush of Demonic into Radiant, but people realize he's easy he's so, so full damage. Bro broken by concepts that, um, yeah, just you don't even need... The way it's really interesting the way I thought... You, I never thought you'd play Malachi like this, but essentially the premise is is that what I've learned is that you never W and Q. You only buttons that you press are E and R, and you just like I, I remember this fight, this situation. It was just cr like this is when I really just it clicked for me for this the way you play this Malachi. We're doing like Baron. I'm like throwing E's over the wall and stuff like that. The Ziggs is trying to poke me us, but he's taking so much damage. He just dies to two E's and one of my R's. It's so funny. He's trying to poke me. You can out poke poke champs. You know, he's like I remember you champ. you said to me, you said you had never felt in your time of playing jungle a more broken champion than Malkai. Yeah. It's Malkai in terms jungle. of yeah, in terms of uh just the ability to control with the saplings and, and if I the, mean if it's, the game gets to mid game with Malkai, you're pro and the game's relatively even, you're gonna win, essentially. Literally broken by concept. Think about it, guys. We're throwing saplings, we're doing insane amounts of damage. From safety. Yeah, think about the, the boxes that one ability does. Scouting, mm -hmm. CC is like a slow, slow. zone control, um, and then obviously the damage itself is just insane. Yeah. It's broken by concept. It is broken by concept. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to see how to right yeah. nerf it, um, but I will still make a guide. I still think that you're just waiting now until that, that yeah. nerf comes out. You really just see if the build needs to change or anything, and then. Because the fundamentals will stay the same, essentially. Well, no, it's a completely different play style. If you play phase oh, rush, right. you W in. Okay, you know, so you might have to change you know. quite a bit of that. Guy. Yeah, it's, okay. it's true. That's why I have to wait. Wait, But I'm hoping it actually still stay the same. I'm happy with the numbers adjusted a little bit. I still think it might be viable okay. still. Um, and even if it gets completely gutted, I think I'm just going to... I have so much footage anyway. I'm just going to make the guide and people can play and so right well. now you're not really focused on learning the game. You're more focused on like the champ mastery specifics, getting into the details of champs. Yeah. Okay. This is, uh, I'm just trying to make guides at the moment. So just chilling in my solo yep. queue, um, having a bit of fun. I mean, you've played, what, 40 games so far? It looks like 24 wins, 15 losses. Yep. And I've played like, yeah, about 50 games-ish. So, yep. Um, yep. And what about you, Curtis? Great. So there's a few observations I've made. So I, I kind of came back from my trip and obviously I was doing two things simultaneously, brushing off my rust from my trip and, uh, and learning the new patch. And 
just like I said last year, I remember I last, last, last pre, not this, not this preseason, this preseason before I learned Casio. And when I headed into the season, like really, really excited to use my Casio that I had developed, it was at the time, this was like the start of last year, Casio was terrible. The meta shifted that dramatically that I went from having this insane success with Gargoyles Casio to the champion feeling terrible. This preseason, um, I had, you know, a, a hunch about the way the game was going to play out. I thought, okay, Syndra was going to be insane. And, you know, I thought that um, I didn't think really Cassio was going to be that strong. And like, I had all these like kind of hunches about the way the game was going to play out. And I was really wrong. My first few days of solo queue was a disaster. Mm. Like I went in really excited to play my first strike Syndra that I'd been refining in the preseason. And I got shit on. And I, I started the season, I think like four wins, 12 losses or something ridiculous. Like I was pretty hardcore negative and I had to make some serious adjustments. And so essentially I was very close to actually quickly making a, an alternation in my pool, like moving Syndra out and adding something in. And I decided to um, sit tight and just find a way to make it work. So I've, I've kind of moved away from the first strike Syndra and been, I think you have to basically go airy in high yellow fast because the games are so fast paced at the moment, what I'm experiencing. And what I realized with Syndra is that when I was going first strike, I was losing pressure. The games were exploding. I wasn't able to like create tempo in my lane and um, the games were over by the time I got strong. So I've shifted my play style with Syndra, which took me a while to like adjust. I realized that there's a few things. Uh, Seraphs and Rod of Ages, Rod of Ages was better than I thought. And Saras is obviously very good as well. So that actually means that Cassio is significantly stronger. Because a I lot thought. of the champions are going Rod of into Seraphs. Isn't Cassidy do that? That's why Cassidy. Yeah, that's why Cassidy is really strong right yeah. now. And Rise as well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, got So that's it. why Rise and Cassidy are probably the two strongest. Because you're tanky and you're sh you have a shield and you do so much damage. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. So, so the Wait, thing would Nivia be good? Um, yeah, yeah. Because Nivia, yeah, I think Nivia, Nivia could be okay. Uh, the thing is. Again, um, I think I, I think Nivia does struggle a little bit in those fast-paced games, just because like That's she's right. very linear and yeah. immobile and stuff like that. So it's been a little bit of an adjustment period, and I, I made a comment this week in the weekly tidbit saying how, yet again, this is another season where I've been humbled, and why I need to permanently be a student of the game. I came in with like, you know, thinking really confidently. Thinking, These are my oh, matchups. I've got sorted out preseason. I've got That's to right. figure it out. And I just got rocked and I've had to relearn a lot of matchups. Like if, now I'm, you know, Casio was always in my pool. That was in my pool of four. My initial pool of four heading into the season was going to be Syndra, Yone, Casio, and, and then I was decided between like either Vex, Ari, or Galio. That was kind of like my one iffy pick. And the three Truro was never going to move. It was going to be the Cassio, the Syndra, and the and the Yone, right? With Syndra, it had all these these, these thoughts, th like I guess intuitions about the way matchups were going to play out. And what I've realized is that um, Cassio is a lot of her matchups have changed, and one of them, the most that has changed, is the Syndra one. Get this: Syndra pre rework was Cassio's hardest matchup. So Syndra would dominate Cassio. Yep. It was the it was unplayable. Yep. Like it literally, it, like because Syndra went in my eyes from a early game lane bully, and like mid game to like now a really scaling. Yeah, champion. mid to late game essentially. Now it's like I, I view it like as an Azir or something. Yeah, like that. it is, and 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 even less weaker early game than Azir. Yeah, it has a stronger it's really early game. Really weak. Sure. Yeah, very weak. I early talk game. about it in the reviews all the time. I. I, there's the cooldowns like a, are very long. Like, oh, Q's like right? it's like seven seconds. Yeah, or something. Because I say, I always say like, let's say it's like a matchup. It's like Syndra versus Lux. I say yeah. don't put too much effort into yeah. this. It's just it's just a it's super sleeper best. play play off sides and you're good. But to that go. would have been completely different yeah, back I mean, in the day, opposite, right? Yeah. And so I I came into the matchup. I remember I played Syndra. I, I picked Syndra. This is when that my first few days of picking Syndra. And I picked Syndra into Castle. I was like, oh, this is, should be a great matchup. And I get in. Because I hadn't really played that matchup since the rework that much. And I just get annihilated because Cassio could do two Qs for every one of my one Qs. That's the, the cooldown difference. That's the, Q, that's the cooldown difference. And I was, I just got like solo killed. I got dominated. And, and then at that point, I started to have a crisis. I'm like, my interpretation of both Syndra and Cassio is wrong yeah. right now. Mm. And I need to go back to the drawing board. Mm. So my first, you know, it's been two weeks, has it been? Since it oh, dude, it's been... A week and a half or something? Yeah, a week and a half, yeah. A week and a half. I, it's been a lot of, yeah, like hum, being humbled and going back to the drawing boards in terms of like understanding my matchups, relearning matchups, coming up with new hypotheses, adjusting my builds, 
feeling out different build paths, understanding how the runes, because remember my goal with the champion is there needs to be perfect alignment between my builds, my runes, and my mindset. That's the key to success. You want to get perfect alignment. You need to understand how they all function and how they tie together, right? There was not alignment on any of my champions, essentially, though, maybe apart from Yone, there was no alignment. And so I had to rebuild that alignment. And and so, for example, with Cassio, what I've realized is that, you know, I like this rower. It feels good. It's definitely not the only option. There are still many viable builds with, with, with Cassio. But then I'm so used to going secondary resolve with Cassio uh, but it doesn't make sense with Roa because then you have no ability haste because Roa doesn't give ability haste and ability haste is so oh, important. So you need to go transcendence and then you need to go secondary sorcery. So that's an example of a small thing that feels really impactful in the game, like having transcendence and not having transcendence or having a row of ability haste, not having a row of ability haste. Like those things matter a lot. So that's what I've been slowly figuring out, building my alignment between runes, build, mindset. Um, and now I feel really good. I've, I've been, again, sticking to three blocks, reviewing my games, um, and I'm doing quite well. So now it's just about getting the reps in. I'm starting to, you know, I'm picking up steam. I'm, uh, I'm really gaining confidence and brushed off my rust. I got a new PC as well, so my FPS doesn't drop. Ooh. So it's all coming together now. So I'm yeah. really excited to just stick to the process now. Yeah. I, you know how everyone says, uh, yeah, because obviously the big change for this year was now they, they've got two splits, right? So we technically only have, I think it's like something like 150 days until yep. this technically this season ends. And yeah, I mean, on pace right now. Like we're on pace. It's pretty, pretty Both chill. of us were on pace. Yeah. You can remember the challenge is top 50, so we need to, need to be top 50. Yeah. But we should aim for at least top 35, I reckon, to be safe. Yeah. But the pressure's on more so than it hasn't been in previous season. That's why I'm more take, you know, from the get-go, really trying to mm. stick to a process, get my regular three blocks in, not get sloppy. Like last uh, season, I got a bit complacent, like I said. Like I wasn't getting enough games in. Really trying to stay consistent with my games. Because um, it makes a big difference. We've said this many times. Like there's a big difference between getting 15 games a week and getting like 21 games or something Absolutely. a week. So that's that, which I'm pretty happy with. Um, so moving on. We've got a bigger announcement to make. Big project this year for us. Big project. This is kind of what we've been working on and thinking about over the past, how long has it been? Maybe like... About a month or so. A month or two. Yep. And so essentially, the big announcement is that Nathan and I have decided to create our own below gold programs, coaching programs. So we've got the Soul 2, we've got the Midland Academy. There's a new one, Soul 2. What's yours one called? The Below Gold Program? Uh, this is Mine's going to be called Soul 2 Academy. Soul 2 Academy and your mid -lane the Midlane School. And, you know, we'll get into kind of what the differences are, but let's first talk about why. Yeah. Okay. Because we've been vocal in the past about how we, we didn't coach uh, Below Gold. Yeah. Right. That's been one of our things. And for the past three years, we've only coached above gold. So I think I think where we I want to start here is talking about why did we initially coach only above gold and do we regret do we have any regrets about our coaching philosophy and, and, and our decision to do that? Do you want to start here? So I've said this before, different skill set. Um, this is something that I'm honestly pretty excited to explore. Like that's the thing. So we're by no means experts. Uh, Definitely not. A really good. You started off with the video you released on your YouTube channel today. Yes, we'll segue into that in a second. We'll segue into that in a second. But uh, yeah, it's a completely different type of student you're working with. Um, obviously, us being high ELO players, we also were pretty disconnected, I think, yeah. as well. from We the, came from the esports scene as well. The, so we were incredibly disconnected. The new player journey. And like, obviously, we have like you know, gold falls, obviously the lowest that we've sort of worked with and that's sort of somewhat connected. So I think over the last two years or so, we've sort of seen, okay, this, I can sort of see like the problems a gold player would have. And then now suddenly we think, okay, well now, yeah, let, let's, let's go down a little bit further and see what's, you know, what problems we can solve. I think there. one of the things we realized is that gold was in the scope of like, like we saw similarities between gold and platinum and then we're like, okay, that's manageable. Like that makes sense. We we can we could somewhat resonate with a gold client. Below gold, it felt like we lost. There, there was it was very difficult for us at that time to resonate with someone below gold. It was mm. so far. It was such a differing skill set. We just both said to ourselves, like, look, we're better off just laser focusing 
on this one element. Figure this out first. Figure this out first. And I, and I don't regret it at all. I think it was actually, even if I were to go back in time, I still would have done it the exact same because it allowed me to really laser focus or allowed us to really laser focus on on um, streamlining that gold to master, essentially, right? Streamlining that. Because we feel like gold to master is very, we can, we know exactly what it takes now. We've done thousands of clients. We know what it takes to go from gold to master. And I feel like we've got that on lockdown. There's obviously room for improvement, but we've got it to a very high level. And I've always said that um, our programs are E to Z. They're E to Z, they're not A to Z. So now with hopefully what we're hoping with these, these new programs that it's going to be A to Z. The whole pathway. The whole pathways. A new, someone who's new to the game, level 30 can come in, they can stay in that program and then transfer to the other program. Or in your case, three programs. Um, so, so, okay, where we should start is um, why is this important to us, right? Why, why now? And 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 um, what motive? What is motivating us to do this? So the because I was the one that brought this to Curtis initially. What I've realized through the comments, through interaction with the community, obviously listeners on the Broken by Concept podcast. There, the game is starting to very much mature now. The you know the top players are the top players. Even in our own games, even if like uh, I mean, obviously we do have new people that come into us, but there's like starting to become I think a wider wider disconnect gap of just how hard the game is and how hard high the barrier to entry is into the game. Uh, unless again you've been playing the game for like multiple years, and obviously what we want to be doing is fast tracking that process. And the new, the new generation, the new player base is really important because that's the, the future of the game. The game, at the end of the day, we're going to get super old. We're going to be like, you know, 40 years old. Like we're hoping to still be challenger players by that point. But um, yeah, getting new players into the game, getting excited. Like Riot don't really release the new numbers to the game. You know, and I think that could be intentional to see, you know, it's like, this is more of just like an aging player base and most of the kids nowadays, they're now just going to play like Minecraft or Roblox. So, you know, we love League of Legends. We want people to, we see the benefits of people getting into the game early on, but it's very intimidating to get into and there's not really a direction for people to go currently. It's very intimidating. It's extremely intimidating to start League now comparatively to in previous seasons. We'll talk about that as well later on. And I think you raise a really good point when you brought it up to me. I was initially, okay, let's hear you out. And then you made a really good point when you said, you know, the the future of League is the new yeah, not, generation yeah. of players. And and we've just realized in a way, like when you when you coach a lot of especially high reload players, we're just the tip of the iceberg. There are millions of players that either don't play ranked at all and have ranked anxiety or have negative connotations or think there's, you know, negative connotations towards ranked or just are stuck in iron or bronze or, and they're too, they're too intimidated or, or overwhelmed to even try to take apart the challenge of getting to gold. And we always thought that gold was kind of low elo. No, there is a whole other subsection, millions of players out there that need help, need guidance. And I've looked online. There is, barely any good quality content getting someone from level 30 to gold. It's a brutal journey and you have to dodge many landmines in terms of narratives, bullshit advice to even get there. And that's if you don't give up. So um, we're taking on this challenge. I think we we need to preface by saying that this is a long-term journey yeah, for us. We, I got no idea what I'm doing right and, now. And I'm framing it just like we started the Midland Academy in the Soul where we're going in from scratch. We're starting to try and develop a, a skill set that we have not yet developed. And we're not here saying we've got it on lockdown. I genuinely don't know how to get someone from iron to gold four, but we need to start somewhere. And so we're starting that journey this year. Um, so if you're the, we've got it on your side and my side, if you want to join the, so get the wait list, yeah. get into logistics here. So we both got a wait list for our programs, just like our normal programs on our website. So mine's saltu.gg. Midlandacademy.com. Mine, you go to the pricing section and you can sign we'll up link, We'll put there. the links in the description here for this yep. episode um, and sign up to the wait list there. We're hoping to, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to do basically a, uh, a, a very small kind of like... Uh, to get a, a bunch of test dummies lab rats lab rats so we're going to do a small opening for around maybe what 30 thinking 30 people around 30 people to be kind of like the uh, initial they're, they're going to be like the 
the OG members, the OG members of the Midland School and the uh, uh, Salton Academy. Academy. So um, if you're interested, make sure you join the wait list on our websites and we'll be hoping to do the opening next week yep. if all goes to plan. But regardless, you'll hear from us in the emails anyway. Uh, I think then we die. And this is actually why I did that video on my YouTube about begin is beginning uh, your journey in League of Legends. So segue into that. You're ready to go into that. Anything else you want to say? About uh, the other the thing as well I want to say is that our programs have like the, you know, the 5,000 review sessions you won't have access to those. Like there's zero content when you're joining this. It's literally like uh, you'll join the program and you're just a person in a Discord server with me. And then we're just going to figure it out. And then over time, we'll slowly build the content out. That's right. And then figure it out. And again, as I said, it's long it's, term. And I want people to think it, it is, it's a different Discord. It's actually not associated for me, especially because like the Midland Academy is this like very sophisticated uh, platform with resources, Discord you're actually not getting that access to that. This is a separate program. There'll be a separate part on the website where we put content from this, this, this the work we do together on on the website, but a separate area. And there will also be a separate Discord. Um, and so yeah, don't... And also, this is not going to be ran like the other program as well. It's not going to be one-on-one -on -one coaching. No. So this is our philosophy, at least at in its current state. We don't really believe that um, these players at these ELO brackets need one-on-one -on -one coaching. We believe that it's more about um, teaching concepts and we want to identify what the concepts are that these people need to learn in these sessions with you guys. Yeah. And which order as well. I forgot yes. which order. And I got some ideas around yeah, we've got Yeah, we've got ideas. But again, this is going to be a journey. Be we, would like, we would like these 30 people to come on this journey with us and yeah. discover it together. So mine's twelve dollars a month. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at twelve dollars for now. I've got to have a think about that. It's over important the next week. for the financial community because we need people that are committed. It's just not going to be free That's and right. just sign up and be like, "Oh, I'm just going to be there for three days and then piss off." Like yeah. we need, we want people that are committed that are willing to take this journey with us. That's right, because we know you won't get results otherwise if you're not committed. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we you know following this conversation we had a month and a half ago. You know, we thought it'd be a really great idea to start by releasing a piece of content, kind of talking at a baseline level. Uh, you know, where should someone start? Like a beginner's guide, essentially. So I released this this video on my YouTube channel last night. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to kind of go through parts of this uh, video yep. and uh, discuss a few topics here. Okay. So I'm going to just go ahead, Nathan, and we can just kind of dissect parts of it. Okay, I'm just going to get up your notes for that. You've got the notes there? Yeah, I'm going to okay. get them up in a moment. Okay. So essentially, um, you know, I start the video by talking about how, you know, league as, you know, we've probably said this a trillion times, it's the hardest game you will play. It's an incredibly brutal game. And the thing is, and this is the crazy thing, is that if you have a bunch of friends that play the game or an older sibling or, or whatever it might be that play, they won't really describe it like that. Like they won't say to you, like they'll, they'll talk about the game. If they're a long-term player, they'll talk about the game as if it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, you just gotta, you pick a champ and then you hit CS and then you take trades. And it's kind of as if like this, there's this complete and utter disrespect for the muscle memory of the game. Mm. And so the way I start the video, which is kind of like, ask them some questions to get a bit of an understanding of their league journey, right? Like how many hours have they played? Like we, we for some reason, overlook the thousands of hours that we've put into the game. Like if you started the game, even if you started the game in season 10, right? You've, at l you've got... Thousand, probably at least a thousand hours in the Even game. if you're not playing seriously, you're still like getting a feel for it. That's you're right. actually building a lot of muscle memory you're not realizing. Like, like how many hours do you reckon they've played over bot games, normal games, ARAMs, all of it together? And I ask them, okay, when then we get into the real spicy stuff. Did your friend have MOBA experience or even any gaming experience before League? Uh, were they a long-term PC gamer? What was their gaming background like? And what season did they learn? And now this is something that I completely underestimated, Nathan. When we first played the game, the game was incredibly unsophisticated. No one really knew what they no were one, doing. No one knew what the hell they were doing. So you would be able to like build confidence quickly and then snowball. Exactly, because no one knew what they were doing. And not be dissuaded from like, oh, this is too hard for me. And also because people had no... Uh, if you learned in season one, two, three, four, five, essentially, right? There wasn't any fundamentals like like there was no wave management really there was it's just get cs get farm get strong and outplay people <laughs> there, was, there was it was so you wouldn't believe how unsophisticated yeah. it was really remember in season two i think it was season two right 
games on average went for like 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes. Remember like the whole Anivia thing? Yeah, because no one knew how to play with waves and everything. Yeah. And also, I remember uh, season three when SKT won Worlds. That was when everyone was obsessing about like rotations. Like, oh my God, someone can rotate from mid to top. Oh my God. Yeah, crazy like, stuff. It's like, what? like we always thought like before that you just stay in your lane yeah. and like, and, and you know, it was this, but that sounds ridiculous when you say it now. But remember mm. like Monte Cristo with the whole like rotations and this team is the best in the world. They can rotate. And like, that was when people were like season three, that's when wave management, it, that, that was only done by like the elite players mm. essentially. Mm. And so anyway, so the, the, and then I kind of go into talk about, you know, what is your league journey? What is your, what is your gaming background like? Like if you, if, if league is your first PC game, you're doing two things. You're learning the game and you're learning how to play an online multiplayer game. And, um, and you need to have a deep respect for the, how this journey is going to look for you versus if you're a long-term WoW player, you played Starcraft WoW, you played Dodo Hon, you're going to have a, a much easier time picking up the game. Specifically as well in the competitive environment, like ranked, you think there's a difference in there? Like playing those games casually versus playing those in the ranked setting? Yeah, even that. Like, did did you try hard in those other games or did you not try mm. hard? In those? Were you a casual gamer or were you like actually trying to climb the ranks? Like, you know, there is a difference between a casual WoW player that never played PvP no. and someone who genuinely tried to get gladiator, like become a gladiator or whatever in WoW. Like, they're very different WoW Absolutely, players. Just like in Counter Strike, you get casual people who do surf and <laughs> all these mods, and then people who try to be like you know competitive. So yeah, that that's a really good point. Um, and the point of that is again, what we're the message that we want. I wanted to get across in this video is managing expectations. <clears throat> having a deep respect for the difficulty of the game because that is what bites you in the ass in the long run. If you don't have that deep respect for the difficulty of the game, guess what else you don't have? You won't have curiosity. Because when things go, go, don't go wrong, you're just going to be, eh, whatever, like that's, that's it, I'll figure it out. No, but if you come in, this is a tricky problem to solve. If you're in that problem-solving mindset from the get-go... Test and learn, test and test learn. Test, learn, test, learn, curious, what's happening, Why? you are going to learn a hell of a lot faster than just the average person that's dicking around. So when you say uh, expectations, hmm. the first thing that my mind goes to in terms of time, um, because let's say if you played any other game, typically you can pick up the game pretty quickly. Yep. And let's say you can... Um, there's no other game really in the world, apart from the established games, I guess like Counter-Strike and stuff like that, um, and other MOBAs like Dota is that there's just all these players that just look insane. Like if, if you're like a new player, like going into even level 30s and all like the Smurfs, like these players would be like, like it's like, dude, it's like these guys are really good. Yeah. No, but they're probably just like platinum players. But yeah, they are really good compared yeah. to you. Yeah. Which is super intimidating. Yeah. But you, gotta have, you gotta have a respect for time, time, time and just yeah. chipping away and learning everything there is about the game. So I think that, yeah, the time and curiosity really important i actually have a part later in the video when i was talking about it now was that I, I, I said what what a stock standard journey would look like if you were to get 600 games a season okay 600 games that's a decent amount of games a season i said okay first season playing you wouldn't even get into ranked you would play bot games normal games mm. and you're slowly trying to figure out what you like about what role you like what champions you like so that's just one year you're gone right second year playing if you were good and dedicated and curious and this is to prefer, this is without coaching. If you were very good and you had a, you had a gaming background, you still played another 600 games, you were pretty decisive about what your role and chance were, go for. That's second year. And that's even that's even impressive. Third year, go for plat four. Even that's impressive. And then think about that. Three years, so 1,800 games, you're at platinum four, right? And some people would think, what? the hell that's only platinum like they compare that to other ranks and other games probably and then but there's a diamond and then there's a master and there's a grandmaster like i'm not even halfway or whatever they would think that's crazy but that's three years and that's even if you don't swap roles that's if everything goes smoothly, smoothly yeah <laughs> that's if everything goes smoothly and, and 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 i think that's a really and that's not even an over exaggeration right that, that's a pretty fair solid journey um and people will think what the hell um, but that's the reality because there is a metric ton to learn about the game. What do you think about that journey? Yep. I think having a deep respect for yep time and just thinking about, yep, first year, get the games in, 
the key thing about getting the games in, the really important part, and what I find a lot with my goal clients is a lot of the things I need to sometimes teach them is just what other champions are doing and how your champion interacts with them. You need to yep. basically learn what all the champions do. Otherwise, you simply can't really win games because you're just going to lose games. I think that's your first year, though. I that's think the first year, That correct. should be your first Your yeah. mindset, your first I'm year. I'm going to learn every champion. What does every champ do? Yeah. That's why you should swap roles. That's why in the first year, you should play everything, essentially. Mm. You should play a bit of everything just to get a feel for every lane, every type of champion. Mm. That will speed up the, the learning journey. Mm. Yeah. And and that's actually one of the great reasons, you know, what they do the, cha the free champ week rotation. That's actually really good. You should play something new every week. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good point. You know, so scrolling through, we've kind of covered a few of this before about the, you know, the amount of go that goes on in, in a single trade, like all this muscle memory. We've kind of mentioned that. We've spoken before about the importance of bot games, like you should be able to farm bots before you move on to normals. Um, and I want to talk about um, the mechanical aspect. Now, this is where me and you differ. Like you came from WoW. And your, your fingers are already placed in the QWER, right? Like you kind of already knew how to place your fingers there without looking. Like for me, I came from the, the FPS background. So that was very difficult for me to do. Like I had to literally look at the keyboard. Um, and so th again, this ties back to understanding your, your gaming background. There is no shame in being you know, taking your time to get a feel for the mechanical aspect of the game, like uh, controlling a mouse and a keyboard. That is never really mentioned when and someone references how long it's going to take to learn the mm -hmm. game. And there are people in the Midland Academy that didn't come from a PC background. They came from a console background. And even to this day, they are still paying the consequences for that. And, and it will take them years more than someone else if they came from a PC background. That's just the reality of the situation. So again, if you're out there thinking about playing League and you've come from a console background, um, you need to understand that it's going to take you significantly longer to get a, a, just a basic comfortability on a PC. And that's why you need to spend time in those normal games, in those bot games and bot games, ideally, you know, uh, freeing up that mental stack, you know, they're not going to be in your face as much. So you can actually just get comfortable with the keyboard and the mouse. And that is never really mentioned. Mm -hmm. Cause that's, that's the point where we're getting to where the, the long-term vision of you as a, as a league player is that, you're doing as many things relying on muscle memory as possible because there's that so much going on in the game. It's literally not possible to see what, uh, get all the information like in, and make those really quick decisions. It's just impossible. And that's what I spoke about in the video. I spoke about the, the mental stack as a concept. I wish I knew about the mental stack as a concept. So when important. I've, like, what the hell? We talk about that a lot in Soul 2 and stuff. Just how important it's like, oh, okay, that mistake <laughs> happens because my mental stack's overflowing. Like, yeah. like that's why a lot of the, the dumb mistakes you see in your games as well is that it's because people uh, overflow mental stacks. Like, uh, you know, and this is, again, having a respect for the concept of a mental stack. Like, when you view it, right, when, when, when you have that deep respect for the mental stack, it makes, it manages your expe expectations mm. automatically. And it just allows you to understand what's going on, which yeah. is so important. It's like, oh yeah, that makes sense why I didn't see that coming because I was focusing my attention there. That's or right. it makes sense why I couldn't see that trade coming because I was focusing too much on the CS. And that's okay, right? That's okay because you, you can't, there is no cheat way to develop muscle memory apart from getting a, right. a lot of good quality, yeah. high intensity games. In. Yeah, That's literally it. Yeah, and being aware of where you're shifting your focus each yes. time, where your where your attention is. Now, I also spoke in the video about um, you know, the importance of CS and farm. Yep, I spoke about the importance of like item spikes. So we're talking about game fundamentals here. Yeah, we started to get into the game fundamentals. Um, and I, and look, I didn't really want to go too in depth here. I think the key that I want to really get across here, there's two things I wanted to get across was, um, you know. Under, this is where champ mastery begins. And I, I will talk about champ mastery later on more, but we might as well talk about it now. Champion mastery. Really, I said this in the last video. You're only doing one or two things in League. You are learn, developing champion mastery or you are learning game fundamentals. You cannot learn game fundamentals before you've developed champion mastery. And so you need to know, at, and this is what ties into the first year if you're playing League for the first year. You should know at a baseline level what everyone's basic spikes are. Like you should know that a Cassidan is weak early game and needs items. You should know that a Kale is weak early game and needs components. You should know that a Nico doesn't really need as many or a, you know, a Zed probably only needs Darius. a Dirk or Dar You know, you should know that. that like 
but that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. You not only have to know their kits, you have to know what their basic identity is and ba- when they're basically strong and weak. How ridiculous is that? Yeah, it's a lot. That's a lot. And that's and that's the that's the levels of champion mastery. That's how it's not so much about using your kit. It's about how your kit, your champion, interacts with yes. all the other kits. Because League is actually a game of anticipation. That's right. It's not about react- fancy reaction time reflexes. The best players, pro players, Curtis and I, none of it's reaction time. No. I have really slow reaction time. No. It's all just anticipation. All anticipation. And it's very, very rare that I'm, ca- I'm genuinely caught off guard by something. Yeah. And when I am caught off guard, <laughs> that's when I lose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's so funny you say that. The only... So think about this. I, I, my last week of games, I've, I've won nearly every game. And the one game I lost, I genuinely didn't know the matchup. Mm. I was reactionary uh, in the matchup. Yeah. That's the one game I lost. Because yeah. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what, they were, I didn't know what to do. So I was just reacting to the enemy. Um, which is, you know, funny, to, funny that that happened. Um, you know, I want to talk about... Fun, okay, we talk a lot about what it leaves a hard game. Right? One, of the, one of the reasons that's the case we've mentioned so far is that there's a lot of information to know. Raw information, knowledge, essentially, right? That's one aspect. We also mentioned the mental stack and how there's a lot of, um, there's a lot going on. The game is naturally fast paced and there's a lot of information in front of you. So your mental stack is occupied. One thing that we haven't spoken about is that league, very little is drillable. So when I think of Counter-Strike, right? I used to spend hours and hours and hours on aim mat, aim trainers. And I could just sit there and just aim and, and, and just train one tap headshots, one tap headshots until it was muscle memory. I could isolate that as a skill. That's not to say I didn't practice, you know, I could go and practice smokes. People do that in Counter-Strike. They go into the map, practice throwing smokes to the pixel perfect. You can actually replicate specific rounds. You can actually get everyone standing in on that map with all those guns, with these smokes going down there and practice that entry. You can even do that. Yep. League has very, very, very few things that you can isolate and drill. That is one of the main reasons League is a hard game. The One of the only things you can genuinely drill, there's two things, clearing your jungle camps and CSing. And, CSing. Yep. and maybe combos, champion combos. That's right. That's basically it. That's it. And so every game then becomes learning and competing hmm. naturally and adapting to what's and Im- going on. Imagine, and we compare that to a traditional sport. We compare that to basketball, right? Imagine that you had to learn the game of basketball only through playing pickup games. Yeah. Imagine you could never drill. You couldn't drill free throw shots. You couldn't. The game would look so much different, right? <laughs> Imagine how different the game. They'll would probably look. like now just get into like <laughs> the eighties, like level right now in like two thousand twenty in terms of like the skill in the game, right? Imagine you couldn't practice dribbling. Yeah. Set plays. No. Three point shots. The shooting would be horrendous comparatively. You would have to gr- and because you can't just keep playing. Pick up game after pick up game because the physical exertion, the level of play would be significantly lower, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. And so that's where we're at. That's why League has actually taken so long to evolve comparatively mm. probably to other games and mm. why it's still evolving. We're trying to still figure out the games because mm. we can't isolate stuff. And I actually think to this day, this is my conspiracy theory, that Riot did that intentionally. I, I don't believe. I don't think that did it intentionally at all. So there's it's two just, arguments, it's, it's right? It's just the snowball nature of the game, right? Okay, there's two arguments to this. The, 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 okay, the first one is the, mine, which is the conspiracy theory that Riot purposefully didn't create a practice tool like that, a custom like tool. Like a sandbox Like mode. a sandbox mode because they didn't want the game to be quote-unquote soft and they liked the scrappy nature and the difficulty of it, which I can understand that from a product perspective. Or their client was so shit that the system, like the underlying code and what they built it on was so sure bad the that they couldn't actually create yeah. a sandbox mode. And so, you know, I, I personally am of the mind if they're a billion dollar company, you know, they're a huge, huge company. They can't create a custom tool. I call bullshit. I'm not a coder. I don't design games. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, we could talk about that conspiracy theory, but but um, the reality is it doesn't exist and that there is no way to replicate that barren play, that tower dive, that specific part of the matchup. You have to... To the, and another thing, sorry, that is dribble is one v ones in the in the lane, early lane phase. You can actually one v one people to learn matchups, but remember, there's no junglers. Yeah, there's no junglers, <laughs> and also as well, it, the snowball aspect. It's not like you can like 
replicate again. I mean, I guess you could do it, but it'd be so much effort, right? To replicate like the tray that happened at level four. Yeah. You can't do that. It's you just can't, level one. You can't just, just like, rewind. Imagine start. you could just rewind, go to level four, make them both level four, these items, yeah. these HP, and then you just yeah. replay and you just keep playing you it. just do it again. Like Street Fighter. Yeah. Like Street Fighter, you can replicate a specific situation, like combos, and it's all those games. Most other games, there are ways to, there's like a sandbox mode. No ways to drill. So, in a long-winded way, that is another huge reason why League is a difficult game. Can't, no drills. No drills. So, moving on. Um, I spoke about this. This is a bit of a bold claim. Yeah. I said, trying to farm and get to your items without dying is 90% of the game. Mm. What are your thoughts on this? Dying, just deaths. We talk, or one of my favorite quotes is there's so much information in a death. Typically, the difference between high ELO deaths and low ELO deaths is that low ELO deaths are pretty low impact. It's technically like... Like a low value. Low value. The enemy didn't have to expend that many resources for it. And the, the, you know, it's not like you can like trade like a dragon or something for it typically. Like, you yeah. know, people are a little bit slow to do that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's sort of just thinking about... And I guess a lot of it comes down to fighting. It definitely... The game... Fighting is really important. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about you know, like strategies, like freezing, waves, all sort of stuff. Like that sort of stuff just doesn't really applicable. It's just, it just got to fight and just understand champions. It's just such an important how they aspect of the game and how yeah. they interact. So, um, yeah. But I don't even think that's for beginners. I think that's at every ELO bracket. And the reason this is the case- The when fighting you, aspect of the game. Yeah, and learning, yeah, your, and learning your limits yeah. and learning how your champions interact. Yeah. That's at every ELO bracket. Yeah. I still do that I, to I this com- day. I completely struggled- yeah, I couldn't climb a certain point in my journey because I just couldn't fight at a high enough level to climb. Like, it's just a reality. doesn't yeah. matter how good my decision-making was, I was always handicapped. Because you have to fight at yeah, some point. That's right. You have to and trade. there's going to be a team fight eventually. It's going to be a skirmish, yeah. yeah. And if you screw it up really bad, you, like, lose the game for your team. I actually want to use this as a little bit of a um, a detour off the what we're talking about because I think it kind of segues into it beautifully. Okay. Um... I'm going to attempt to ask you a question that I don't even know if it applies to jungle. Okay, here we go. (laughs) Okay. So, you know, it feels like... I'm going to just speak from my own experience and then we can extrapolate from there. So, so when I... I feel like when I'm jumping into a game, I already kind of know if I'm actively trying to limit test and push the limit and like really test what I'm capable of doing and whether it's like my champion's limits and if I'm willing to take risky plays or I'm not... And this is like an underlying mindset. I kind of like have this mode where I'm like in conservative high percentage mode. And then there's like a, okay, I'm willing to take more risk mode. Like for example, uh, you know, let's say for example, I, I'm not sure if I can kill someone in this specific situation. There's, a, 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 and I, I had a game like this the other day where I was playing Yone into Aurelia, right? And there was a situation I'm like, I think I might be able to kill here. If I play, if I go in and I R and I, I combo here, I think I can kill. But I'm going to win the game anyway because I've got two winning sides. I'm scaling beautifully anyway. I don't need to take that play. Now, if we dissect that exact moment, many, many people would make that, they would make the decision to go all in and to, to figure out whether or not they could kill. Now, if we actually dissect that, that decision to go for that kill will give you a lot of learning. Right? Because if you, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. But... If you want to win the game. If you, if you want to increase the chances of winning that game, that specific game, in that context, with win, two winning sides, I don't need to make that play. I'm actually going to forego that learning to win the game. In the long run, that actually caps you out. In the long run, at some point, if you keep doing that, you will plateau. Especially if you play a skirmish oriented champion, you will plateau because you will verse better quality opponents where you need to be able to take those plays. You will get punished for not taking those plays and you plateau. So, so, so I got a question from a client and he's someone who's trying to push to high challenger. He really wants to push to high challenger. And he said, Curtis, I'm really conflicted because I'm in these situations a lot like that where I, I know that if I went for it, I could maybe get the kill. And I know that if I did it, I would learn. And I would take, I'll, I'll get better at my limits. He plays Aurelia. But I know that if I want to win this game, 
I and climb, I probably shouldn't go for it. Mm. What do I do? How should I think about taking risk in League of Legends? How do you... So, you know, and, and I said, and he, what he did before you answer, he said, I boiled it down to three... There's three options, three mindsets that you can be in. The first one is this conservative one that I said before, which was don't take risk, take the high percentage play, even maybe missing out on learning a little bit because you're going to win. The second one is limit test central. Any play that you're remotely unsure about, do it. Now you're going to lose a lot of games that way, but you'll learn, you're going to learn a lot more. And then number three, which is kind of like a balanced approach, which is kind of like very specific, very strategic limit testing that it's like you're, you're limit testing things that like that, like a concept that you own, you really want to learn or isolate. Like say you want to learn a matchup or you want to learn like translating leads or, or, or barren calls or whatever the fuck it is. It's like you're getting very specific about what you want to limit test with. He decided to go for this balanced approach, but I don't know... I, 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 again, this is very messy. And I, so I just want to get your take on this. I just want to blurt it all out. I don't really know what I'm even yeah. asking. So, I mean, yeah, I, I can definitely... See there's there's from? a difference between a jungle's perspective as well because as a mid laner and like a laner, technically you can always like fight, right? As a jungler, you do have really limited windows. You know, like you're going to be hitting yeah. the camps and then, you know, a fight's going to break out and I guess you could just like force the fight or whatever and limit test. But isn't the, no, I, I get where you're coming from, but... As a jungler, those situations would happen less often, but they still are there. They're still there. So what's your mindset with this? Right? Like, like, okay, let's talk not about your clients, you. Let's say there's a there's a play, there's a, there's a, there's a fight in bot lane, and you don't know whether you would win the 3v3 or not. You genuinely don't know. Oh, it's hard to say. What do you that, do? That so rarely happens though, dude. Because as a jungler, like you can so what does that, clearly how, how does that see work? Ah, it just works, dude. It's just the way it works because you, let's say, look, because a lot of the time I'm looking for counter ganks, right? And counter ganks, you just win those all the time because they right, cause throw them Right, because it's not like a, it's, it's not, not just like a, a it's not a fair fight. fight. Yeah, 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 it's right, not a fair fight. Because it's involving fog of war yeah. and information whether they know you're there or not. Yeah. And I know that I have my ulti up and all Okay, what stuff. about situations where you're not sure if you win the dragon fight or not? Or like, 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 uh, have you ever been in those situations? I actually had a review actually where, um, I had a review with Psyker and we were talking about like he was an eight no graves, but he thought he couldn't win the fight. And I said, you a hundred percent will win this fight. Like you're going to be confident in this. Mm. Like you're an eight to zero graves. Like, cause they they had some fed members and stuff like mm. that, but like, and, and they had a team fight sort of comp yeah. and he couldn't really grasp it. And I was like, sort of just trying to like, trying to really get across the way I thought it played out, but it was really hard to, I don't mm. think we really actually came to an agreement at the end. You know, he basically just trusted me. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll just take mm. it next time. Um, yeah, I mean, you've just got to go, you just got to sometimes just send it, dude. Like as a jungler, I, I send it a lot of the time. Because in sure. it, from a jungler's perspective, you're saying that like I'm fighting a dragon, dude, like I'm fighting this dragon. Like that's just the way the game is as a jungler. Like I'm not giving, if I'm an eight zero graves, I'm not giving this dragon. But do you think, even if I'm not sure if I'm going to win. No, but do you think that you, you're only thinking that or only capable of knowing that because you've done so much limit testing? Yeah, that's, that's the thing as well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know your champion, what you can and can't do. My champions are really simple as well, Curtis. I'm not playing Yone where you can always win a fight. Right. I can only win a fight with Vi with R I'm confident in or like Rek'Sai. Right, know? right. So Maybe you really don't hard. play the champs that you can resonate with. No, that. I can't. Right. So like it is clearly yes or no. It, let's say if I play champs like Karthus or Graves, mm. then Kindred yeah, th that's why those are harder to coach because yeah, you can win a lot of fights. Mm. It's not as crystal clear. Crystal what do you player. say to your clients? Those clients that play Graves and Kindred and they come to a situation, should I have taken this or not? Like, I We don't really cover that much in the reviews. I, I can't really coach that. Right. It's hard to coach. And that's my point, right? And my point is basically saying risk and this whole like, it's kind of like a, sh a short and long-term investment. Like in the short term, okay, so the conclusion I came to, this is my current stand, my, my stand on this, is that if you feel as though you're, you're like, you're not getting challenged in a particular elo bracket. Like you feel like you're very comfortably climbing. Like you're, you know that you're better than the opponents. You just got to get the reps in. I say just play conservatively. That's right. And then when you get to a point where you're starting to feel like you're plateauing and you need to like push, you don't really know what's wrong. You're, you're plateauing. That's when I think you need to like actively limit test a little bit more to see kind of like 
what's missing and and what you're fundamentally misunderstanding about the game and then kind of strategically limit test and then and then go back to the conservative you need to like be in these limit testing phases and then you need to go back to a conservative style yeah. but the, the scary thing is is what for most people when they go they, they live in the limit testing phase i've got players and you probably have them without even knowing this they live in the limit testing phase I am aware permanently that yeah so the, if any, they'll take any fight. they will take any fight yeah. even if they know they can win the game anyway yeah because it's fun, dopamine. Yeah, that's right. Dopamine is fun. <laughs> it's fun to kill And they people. live in it. No, but the, but then they think as well. Oh, oh, but like that's the way to learn, right? And in a way, they're correct. But you do need to ease off, take the foot off the pedal a little bit to to kind of see where you're at. If you're permanently learning and not executing, you don't actually know where you're at. No. So yeah, it's, it's something that I need to explore more, and I don't really know how to articulate mm. it, and I, I I don't actually have the right answer. Mm. I don't feel like I have that that solved. Mm. Um. So yeah, it's just a very interesting, and this ties into the death. It was a segue into deaths. You know, we know that one death changes the complete outcome of the game. At the same time, though, you can't play as if you're not. You can't play like a bitch in League no. of Legends. You've got to be willing to die. That's right. Dying is a part of League of Legends. Yeah. So it's this weird contradiction. It's this gray area, isn't it? Where it's we know that a death can lose you the game, but I have to play as if a death doesn't lose me the game but it will lose me the game. It's like this weird, weird, it is weird. Bit, isn't it? Yeah. And welcome to League of Legends, I guess. Um, yeah. And I always, I, I, we, we've been watching that climbing documentary and, and it reminds me how do people learn that skill? Like these dangerous free, you know, these free climbs on the mountain and they probably have environments in which they harnessed up, right? When they're learning. So they can limit test, they fail can. and then drop right. back. They're not going to die. But in League... The only equivalent of that is normal games, I guess. But even then, you still want to win those games and you still might be missing out so many learnings in that game still yeah. because of the snowball aspect of the game. Yeah, and that is another reason why the game is the snowball-centric aspect of the game. Uh, in that video, did you cover stuff about like ranked narratives and your teammates and stuff like that? Like narratives? Yep. So what we'll do, yeah, we'll skim forward a little bit. I have a clip that I want to play. I actually want to show you. This is okay. what I was uh, sent. Uh, in my Discord, it's from this guy on TikTok called uh, Gamer Dad TV, and he's okay. a he's a bronze one um, top laner. He plays, he plays Ergon and stuff. Okay. Let's look, it's like a little TikTok. I'll, I'll show you what he has to say, then we can break this down. Okay. Hey there. So not a flex, but I'm getting better. Um, where our hack room started inting and eventually quit, and we were four v five, and I'm like, and two of them are like, let's quit, and two of us are like, let's not. And I can't remember. I was running like maybe two. I was doing two, two, two. I was doing okay. And after that, I just went ham. And in my head, I'm like, you know what? This is a good learning opportunity. I want to play 4v5 because I got to play tighter and I got to play better. And we did. And we started working as a team. And, and it was great. Like we were killing them and coming back and doing a good job. And we didn't win. But, you know, every time we killed them and sent them all back, it did hurt their little souls a little bit. And I'm like, you know what? Never give up. Never surrender. And, and it was good. I'm like, if I can hold my own in a 4v5, then, you know, I'm probably going to do okay when I get a good team and everything goes well. See ya. Wow. Dude, we got to interview this guy. <laughs> uh, oh, I've never he, seen that guy. He before. had another one. What the hell? Oh, here we go. So that's so that's that's one where he's more optimistic, right? Okay, he has a All right, one. Sorry, and then Oh god. Sorry. Yeah, again, I want to sort of show you. So it wasn't that cool, he's sort of like in a learning yeah, environment and stuff yeah. like that. And then this is another one. So this is a really important <laughs> I one. I swear now. there is a rank curse. You know, if you're just about to do your promos, you'll get like the dumpster fire team. I wasn't paying attention and I should have dodged. This is my first game since I got into B1, and this has happened dozens of times. I've been B1 about a dozen times, almost silver four. And the first two games or so, as soon as I hit B1, are horrible. Like, I, I wasn't paying attention, then I looked down, and everybody had like 24%, 15%, never played, and the other team 60%. I am God. And I, it was horrible. I had three, I had the jungle, the mid, and the top hanging out in my lane, beating me up. And then after that, it just, it was sadness. It did. This is a thing, right? This is a thing. Let me know in the comments. See ya. <laughs> what? This guy be real. This guy's not real, is he? Yeah, he's real, dude. <laughs> he's he's gamer. He's got a YouTube channel. <laughs> he's got ten k views, dude. He plays weird. <laughs> it's just so weird hearing that from someone so old. You know? <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's so like ridiculous. the way they're talking about the game. It's so funny. Like <laughs> I can't get over that. 
I don't even know what to think, honestly. It's so overwhelming. Um, so that one there, he's talking about how um, every time, like, the ranked curse, like, it, when he gets to promos, it's like, it's like working against him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, th- I think there's a perfectly logical explanation for for promos for most people. It's they know they're in promo, so they play differently. It's literally as simple as that. Well, he's going, he's like looking at their win rates and then he sees like the 30% win rate person, the 60% win rate on the team and stuff like that. Like, I mean, it depends okay. on your sample size. Okay, this or... is, I'll, I'll give you something here. Yeah. Okay. It's just like, I feel like it's just not the thing that should be focused on. You know? <sighs> I'm extremely passionate about this, Nathan. All right. If I see a client open up that shitty Poro Fessa before <laughs> yeah. my game, I'm going to, I lose my <laughs> shit, right? I instantly say. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a client, someone who's new to the MLA the other day and he opened it up and he, I'm like, what are you looking at here? And he says, oh yeah, I saw that the Evelyn was a Smurf and their mid jungle's duo and the Evelyn's a Smurf. And I said, I said to him, well, yeah, we're basically going to lose this game because you are going to play differently. That information that you've just internalized is going to make you play differently. It's going to make you play scared. You're going to play worse. You're going to doubt. You're going to head into a skirmish and he's like, oh yeah, that's a Smurf. It's going to be in the back of your mind. You know, you must treat everyone as if they're just a random player. I have beat, I've actually done this, uh, looked at this before, right? I've been playing on my, uh, you know, just playing um, on, on my second account at times and I just play and I was checking my OBG and I'm like, oh, this guy, I won this game. And his account was literally just like, it was obviously, you know, a booster or something. And it was kind of like, you know, 20 wins in a row. And then the loss was against me. And imagine if I went in to that game knowing that this guy had won 20 games in a row, was like a one trick, probably boosting some account. Yep. Would I have played out of my mind that game and 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 never hesitated and just played his fourth game? Probably not. I probably would have been... Overthinking. If overthinking. he started getting fair, you're like, oh, well, here's, this here's this another game again he's where this guy gets in. first win, yeah. Who knows how it would have affected yeah. me. And I beat those players all the time. But I think I beat them all the time for a reason because like, I'm the one that's playing confidently versus this guy. And is the, the, that guy has the edge versus a lot of players because everyone uses OPG and all this so crap. Scared, yeah. And they, and they check it. They, as a, they, they wait till the lobby goes in and then they check everyone as they're loading in. It's incredible. So please never, ever, ever check. You can check after if you want to check. Never check before. You shouldn't. I don't want you to know a single thing about your opponent. Because we are not capable as humans to use that information logically. Because what the argument people say is, oh, but if I know they're duo, I know that I'm going to get canned, blah, 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 blah. You should adapt to that anyway. You should be leaning wardings. If they're paying attention to you, you adapt to that. You see tendencies of team. You should know this shit. Yeah, just because I'm duo with someone, I can't, there's still good ganks and bad ganks. Yeah, I can't it doesn't change the game. Yeah. It doesn't change the game. Like I could, I could lose, like I see all the time people like duo and stuff. Dude, you lose the game for your team because you're just doing really bad plays. And ev- if it's an, ev- an Evelyn's an Evelyn, just because he's 120 games in a row it doesn't change no. what the Evelyn does in the game it's an Evelyn is an Evelyn period so that guy I reckon what he's done he's checked these stats before heading into the game and he's used these stats as a way to as influence his behavior and hence why he's losing all these placements because that's probably impacted his this his um hmm. his decision making or his mind's heading into the game and you know what's very convenient is that you never hear about this when they're they never nitpick the win rates of people when they're not in a promos. No, that's right. If they did that every single game, they would see that these players exist in all of their games. Yeah, it all nets out. Eventually. It all nets out. You can highlight that one game, but I guarantee you, you would have games like that when you're not in promos. Mm. They just want to create a narrative. They want to create an explanation as why they're losing promos. promos when, yeah. they're, oh, when, they're, when the explanation is very simple, you're just playing worse because you're in promos. Yeah. The thing I want to mention there is that he talked about they sent three people to kill me, whatever, and it's just like yeah. unfair and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Well, the way you get into the details there is that if they're putting three resources to you, they're doing it a lot. Guess what? You must be getting advantages somewhere else in the Think map. Think about that in terms of like, again, a traditional sport. If if Michael Jordan is getting three manned, that's right. that means if he is dragging three people you're probably going to win as long as you don't get injured. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> you know? right. That's all you got to do, yeah. right? In that situation. 
Right. Or you just don't pass the ball to him. You just yeah. you just win the game somewhere else. Like basically, what a lot of players think is like they're getting camped and they can't. They think they're the hero they're, of the game. And their teammates are so useless that yeah. even if you know, but in a way, your job you can win the game by drawing by not pressure. dying. Yeah, I say this to a lot of my clients: if you die to the jungle once, you've now changed the entire outcome of the game. Absolutely. If I get if I get a successful gank off as a jungler. That could give me an extra That's item. It. Like I'm so much stronger I than any jungle. I have so much impact on the map. In my mind, if I if if I die to a Diana jungle at level three, the chances of me winning that game are so like it instantly half goes down. Literally lot, halved right. in, in one one mistake. Mm. A jungler getting another kill. So if you die and you die that once and you die a second time to that gank, nothing your team that your team can't make up that difference. No. That's the thing. Your team can make up the difference if you don't die, though. Mm. You go down two waves, they'll get two plates. Fine. Mm. And if anything, they're losing XP, so it's a net positive. Mm. But people don't think like that. No, they don't. They it's don't just, know how to minimize. It's just the the immediate getting camps. Poor me. Well, this ties into my favorite part of the entire video, which goes into bad pieces of advice, right? And one of the, the bad pieces of advice, we'll get into it now, which is the kind of like the 1v9 mindset. Um, where is it here? I don't understand how to use my own phone here. Sorry. How the hell do I use an iPhone? Honestly. Um, okay. Bad advice. Bad advice. Number. Number five, I believe here. Try to be a 1v9 player. Focus on carrying all the noobs. You only, and then my, and so that's the bad advice, right? Yep. My answer was the no bullshit answer. You only need to do your job to win games. Nothing more, nothing less. If your job or role in the game revolves around peeling another fed carry, so be it. The 1v9 mindset puts you in this toxic and generalist, it's toxic and generalist because you're coming in with a frame, like a frame of mind that, um, that you are the carry and you have to go above and beyond to beat everyone on your team. So what does that, how does that manifest usually? Going to the side lanes, split pushing, um, all this crap. And that's not specific to what you're seeing in that game. So the less specific you are, and if you come in with this preconceived idea that you have to be the one that carries and you're getting camped, you are going to lose that game 100% of the time because you will not identify your role correctly. And isn't that weird as well? How like the, the idea of identifying your role is so foreign to people mm. and just doing your job. Mm. They always have to do more. And the thought as well is that People don't as well don't talk about or think about my champion is actually just not that good this game, so I can't do that much. Yeah. One of my favorite examples <laughs> is uh remember that doper example you always use? I always reference this where he plays Fizz, right? Mm, mm. And Fizz is an assassin yeah. by nature, isn't he? Yeah. But Doper has games and he's talked about this Peel where Fizz. he plays Pill Fizz. That's his role in those games, and he has massive impact in those games that like wins those games straight up. Yep, and there are terrible fizz games where you need to. That's the best thing that you can do because mm -hmm. I've just I'm happened to be picked fizz in this game. I got unlucky in the draft. That's the way the cookie crumbles. But what a lot of people will do in those games, they try to force the playstyle all the time, not get into the details, not adapt to the game, and then they'll just maybe just throw us as a thirty percent loss or something like that. It's yep. just oh, it's just a bad team. I should have picked somewhere else. But you can win those games with those champions. That's yeah. where champion mastery really kicks. That's where in champion again. mastery comes in. Or sometimes you you can play well. Do your job and still lose. That's right. That's the nature of the game. That's what you sign up for. And and that's the real tough one. Mm. And 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 look, we could talk about this for hours, but this is where a lot of people um this is where a lot of people lose their minds, right? Because they'll play one game, do their job, yep. win. Yep. They'll do one game, do their job, lose, and then and then they're starting to doubt doing their job. It's like, well, they, Curtis and Nathan told me to do my job. I, I, I'm doing my job. My AD carry is fed. And then the AD carry that game happens to make a mistake and die. And then off that one game or two games, they lose their mind. And, and they, then they're like, I'm never playing with AD carry. Never doing again. that again. Every AD carry again is trash. <laughs> I can't trust my teammates. They all, you know, they extrapolate from that one game. And this ties again back to the, the pierce of resistance of, of the, the, the BBC. You're only going to climb with something like a 53 
That's right. Game. You're going to lose a lot of games. Be prepared to lose a lot of games. That is really the crux of everything. That's it? right. You have is. to be willing to lose games and understand in the grand scheme. And that's where reflection ties into reflection, reflecting yep. on your weeks, getting context. And actually, that's why reviewing is important because if you don't know why you lost the game, you're going to you're gonna come out of every game thinking that it was a 30% loss. It was out of your control. Um, and it really actually all boils down to that, doesn't it? It actually, at the end of the day, all of it boils down to reviewing your games and seeing what's happening and trying to make sense of it and how you contributed to the situation. Absolutely. That is literally it. Yep. And it's hard though. It's not easy to do. There it's are many barriers difficult. that are yeah. preventing you from doing that. It's hard to look at your own gameplay objective and just magic be like, oh, okay, thank you, Curtis and Nathan. I know exactly why I lost this game. I'm not tilted at all. I'm going to move on to the next one. People believe, by the way, that, you know, we talk a lot about reviewing that, you know, we've said this as well, that l reviewing is a skill. I, I just want to, I just want to really um, emphasize this. I l literally couldn't watch my own gameplay. It was so, so, so hard for me to watch my own gameplay. I remember when we were playing on Dials back in the day, season, I think it was season five around and i remember there was a time where we had those competitions would come to fly to sydney and would do the finals and stuff and so and, and that was when people were reviewing people started to review with you know, vod reviews and stuff vod reviews yeah that was a, that was a team thing right that was a team it thing. wasn't an individual but thing. still like that was when reviewing started to become and, and at the time there were players that did review like shernfire shernfire reviewed his games religiously like well like what the hell hmm. for me anyway i I, I got like a physical reaction to looking at my own gameplay. Mm -hmm. Like it's I was disgusted, disgusted yeah. and I, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I, I literally couldn't. You'd rather just avoid the situation. I would rather say something that would protect my ego, even at the expense of me becoming a better player, mm. just so I didn't have to look at the VOD properly. Because it feels I'll just bad. brush it off. I'd be like, oh yeah, like oh, someone asked me what happened there. I'd be like, oh yeah, it was just some blah, 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 blah. Just brush it off essentially, some bullshit answer. But I was okay with that. Like mentally, I was okay with that. It literally took me years, even in 2017, when I was a coach of Die Wolves as the head coach and I would play my own solo queue, I still couldn't really review my own games. <laughs> and you were a coach. And I was a coach. Yeah. It took me, I would say, over the cro a span of like four to five years to properly, pro with no ego attachment, to review my own games. Oh, four to five years. Right, just to let that sink in, because there are people that say, "Curtis, I can't review." Mm. I was the same, mm. <laughs> and uh, so it's not easy. It is not easy to review your own games. Super important to understand that it's going to be difficult at the beginning, but overall, uh, after it just becomes a habit. You know, when you realize that it's a, it's a it's a necessity. Yeah, it's an yeah, absolute just, yeah, necessity. There's no other solution. <laughs> there's no other solution. Don't delude yourself no. into thinking that there's any other way. Mm. Um. Because that's what I thought. I thought I, I I tricked myself into thinking I don't need to review. Well, you think you're special. It's like oh, exactly. I'm special. I thought I'm special. I thought I was special. That's yeah. right. Uh, that's what was really funny. So I think it's good to go over these bad pieces of advice. Continue yep. to go over them. Let's keep going. Um, play the meta. They are the strongest and most overpowered. Right. That's classic piece of advice we get. No bullshit answer is meta doesn't mean anything below master. Everyone is playing so suboptimally below master that the stat differences are negligible. Uh, and I spoke about how, like, if Lux gets a buff, 40 damage, it doesn't do jack shit because everyone's missing their E anyway. If you hit one more E, you've already made up the difference. And then on top of that, the, the main important piece is that the more you swap your champions and adapt to the meta, the less champion mastery you will have. Therefore, you're spending less time learning the game itself. Yep. I'll add on an extra one to that. One of my favorite sayings as well is that the more you focus on runes and items, the worse you are at the game. Well, that's a very bold statement. It's a very bold statement, absolutely. So where did that come from? That just came from my observation from uh, a lot of the comments on my guides. Mm. I have it's an entire guide around all the fundamentals, all the way you should be using your abilities that I know that these players aren't doing, but their comment is, no, nah, this is this item's better. You got to use this item, stuff like that. And do the attention just completely in the wrong place. Mm. The same principle. Well an extra like this item even if it was better while well, you're missing your vi because you're not doing this properly so well, well, you're not or like even like you go back to the rec side guide you're teaching people gank fundamentals yeah. whether you go conquer electrocute or <laughs> that's right 
Doesn't matter. Yeah, people just focus on all the wrong things. And items of runes are the most sexy and why new players and lower elite players focus on it a lot because that's what they have control of. It's the easiest thing to fix. Yes. It's the most convenient thing yeah. to fix. And, right. and there's lots of examples of like YouTube, oh, new, awesome OP build. Yeah. Use this, abuse this. And that does work sometimes, yeah. but in the long term, it never will help you in terms of the actual skill of the player. Yeah, and that's the thing. It, they are right. It, it can give you that edge in the short term, mm. but it does long-term damage. Mm. That's the that's the real that's key right. there. And when I say the more you focus on runes and items, the worse player you are, this is again talking about like beginners and like like obviously it does really important in high, high, high elo, you know, like yeah. Master Tier Plus. You know, it's crazy. Like the more um, we coach and we do these videos, the more like I actually think plat is like high elo kind of. Yeah, it is. Like plat is high elo. Yeah. But I never, ever, ever would have said that no. a few years ago. No. But it actually is. If you're platinum four, you're... Just look at the stats, dude. What's the, what's the plat? Yeah, 10%? even gold, you're in top whatever i don't know the it's percentages like but it's surprising 20 or something like that yeah it's it's pretty crazy yeah. like you're definitively objectively stat wise a high like a, in the high percentages of the player base if you were to do any other craft you're in like the top 20 percent. that's pretty high still like you're not a beginner at all yeah 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 if you're pl getting and, and and i'm going to still stand by this statement if you can get to platinum four you can get to master I believe that. I yeah. really do believe that. Mm. If you can get to Platinum 4, you can get to Master. Mm. Um, there's no reason why you can't. Um, another piece of advice here, talking about matchmaking. Matchmaking is terrible. You always get trolls. That will stop you from climbing. That's what Gamer Dad was talking about. Yep. And, and therefore, you should just buy a higher MMR account, right? Because yeah. you can just skip all the crap. Yep. And I said the no bullshit answer. If you aren't the troll, then the odds are already in your favor. Just run the numbers, right? Four trolls on your team because you're not the troll and five trolls on the enemy team. Yeah. Highly likely. Um, it means, yeah, over time you will win. All you need to do is focus on improvement and gameplay. Let the trolls deal with themselves. The other thing I said is that there's no way of really knowing your true rank unless you've played hundreds of games in that rank bracket or just hundreds of games in general. Like you can't, you can't skip it. You just can't. And, and, and what I've realized is that most players don't know what the difference is between... Actually, I'm not... Actually, I'm actually going to make a bo even bolder statement. Basically, every player, 99.99% .99 of players don't know the differences between ranks. They think it's something completely different. Mm. They think the difference between, you know, Platinum 4 and Diamond 4 are like these huge, massive things. It's not really huge, massive things. It's very small things adding up over the course of a game, but that's not the way they perceive it. They perceive it. Don't, they, they perceive it completely different. They think, you know, a platinum four doesn't know anything, and blah 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 blah. And a diamond four, you know, has insane mechanics. It's really not like the mechanic differences. Some sometimes they are there, but for the most part, it's like well, they're a little bit more aware of things. Um, they they've got a little bit more confidence in their movement and their abilities. They have more consistent fundamentals. They don't die as much and they have much clearer, usually much clearer understanding of their champ's identity um, and their role in a game. But it, it, but that manifests in very small decision differences that add up over time. And, uh, you know, it would be very surprised. It would be very interesting, right? This would be a really great experiment. If we got five VODs and we picked five VODs from five different players at five different ELO brackets and we got an average player to guess the ELO of each of those players to see what they think this gameplay is. I bet you they would look at like like high low, like we talk, we would put like a master or a gem in there and they would they would think that's diamond or something. Or they, they would get it completely wrong. They would overestimate what they think a challenger player can do, and they would they would they wouldn't realize that it's really not that much yeah. different. I could literally I, I could already think of grabbing a vod for one of my games. The way I play a team fight, it would could look like a gold game. Yeah, and they're like, oh, that's a gold player. It's it's interesting, isn't it? When we the, the more we've played the game, the more we've realized that the, what actually makes the high relo players high relo player is not the fancy stuff. It's fancy basics, consistency. And we're the living proof of it because we're not fancy players. No, I'm not. I'm the complete. I'm the least fanciest player of all <laughs> Yeah, you're time. the least fancy player, but we're not very fancy. No. But what an interesting experiment that would be though. If they had to truly, you get you get like a platinum four player and we show them five VODs. Be fascinated to see what they think. Hmm. And you'd show them in random order. 
I reckon they wouldn't be able to guess at all. They might be able to guess the low, the low one, maybe like you guess mm. if there was like a, a silver in there mm. or a bronze, mm. but they wouldn't be able to tell the difference really between a gold Golds and a diamond or stuff, even. Yeah. I, I, I would even say more than that. I don't think really? a high gold and a D four. I don't think they would barely be able to tell the difference. Mm. Okay, as long as both of them were playing their main champion, you get it. Yeah. You get a a diamond four Syndramain and then a, and then a gold one, a gold two Z main. I don't really think you'd be able, majority of people would be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and that's like looking at like one clip or two clips. That's what you're saying, or the whole game. I'm saying anything, any part of the game, really. You could really? Do, whether it's team fights, whether it's lane, okay. I don't think you would really, an average platinum player wouldn't be able to tell the difference, I don't think. Barely. Absolutely barely. Yeah. At least from what I, what I, and what we've seen and what I've seen in the community. And what people's expectation is of high elo and what they think it is. Hmm. Because what we, what you know, when, when we coach clients and they end up climbing to a high elo bracket, what do they usually say? They're surprised like, oh, like I thought it's not how I thought it would exactly. be. Exactly. They yeah. say that every time. It's yeah. not what I thought it would be. Yeah. Because yeah, a lot of the times you're like, oh wow, it's crazy <laughs> when all the basics and stuff. They're all making basic mistakes yeah. still. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that was a huge one with uh, Ishan. Hmm. He was like struggling a lot in like platinum two, platinum one, and then gets a diamond, which is huge, and there's rockets to D two, D one. It's like, wait, wasn't it's meant to be hard, isn't it? But he was just getting all the fundamentals down really well in platinum one, <clears throat> and then he rocketed up. So honestly, I think we've covered the main things here that I want to cover in this video. Yep. Um. So I'm, you know, I'm excited to to start this journey. And I think we'll probably share a lot of our findings as we as we go through yep, this thing. podcast. This year will be a lot about our learnings for sure. There'll be so much to share, absolutely. And yeah, I, and this will be a really good episode and your video as well that you released to sort of see this is what our initial yes. perceptions were, and that could be completely like. And this, this is, is information we thought that was relevant to mm. people in these elo brackets, mm. and we might come back like a year later, and be like none of this even matters. Yeah. Could be. We could be completely wrong. Or we could be geniuses. Or could we be spot on? We could be, <laughs> <laughs> we could be like Steve Jobs of coaching. I don't know. Yeah. I do want to quickly talk about maybe one or two things here at the end that I found interesting. Uh, actually, uh, okay. Nathan, do you ever get questions that you find sometimes that are just absolutely kind of impossible situations and you don't know how to answer it? Yep, Absolutely. Uh, oh god I had one this week um, no nah, can't remember okay it. so I got this question and, 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 and I said to him I said I'm going to answer this on the BBC with Nathan okay. but, I, I, <laughs> but I, I, I said this not because I want to answer the question but because I want to show I want to explain that sometimes there is not a solution okay yep very important so here we go I just watched a new episode of the BBC. This was last week. He said, I, I have a few questions, um, essentially. So he's basically talking about champ pool. I want to extend my champ pool. And he, uh, he played league pretty early on, um, like last year. And he peaked silver three uh, before the reset. He's a very new player. Up until now, he's been one-tricking Aurelia. Which is a, he's basically new to the game, silver Aurelia player. Uh and I want to accept my champ pool and I'm pretty unsure about what to do. He says, I just don't have fun with easy champions. I like playing more complex champions. We have ability resets, dashes, just like Aurelia. During the podcast, you said that having fun is the most important aspect of learning a champion. But another thing you said is that too many complex champions in a pool is not great. Continuing to one trick is not a possibility for me because get this, Nathan, I play in my university's esports team. We are a pretty small university. That's why a silver made it on the team. Another problem I'm facing is that I play top lane on that team, not my main mid role. <laughs> there was already a mid lane and more experience on the team. And I don't really know what to practice, what champion I should learn. A champion that could play top and mid would obviously be best for this situation and generally what to expect because I play with gold and platinums in my team and I've only been playing for one year. I do feel the pressure to perform on the team, but when Aurelia is banned, I'm just screwed. <laughs> yeah, there's no solution. <laughs> 
The solution is to <laughs> not play that role on that team and focus on your role. If you want, if your goal is to improve at the game. I just love this. I love this question because it's like the most ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it's also the way he's asked it as well. It's like, it just goes on and on. It's like, this is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. They're all connected. <laughs> but like... Just don't put yourself in these situations. No. It's like... You you got to okay. If the first thing that is as hilarious to me is that you can't be a one trick and a competitive player. Okay, you can't. You, you, nothing. Okay, you can't have a massive champion pool and climb in solo queue, but you can't have a small champ pool and play competitive. You you can only climb with run ro- one main role but you're playing two roles. So there is all these contradictions that are kind of in the same situation. So the obvious answer is quit the team, all right? Come back two years later, a year, two years later when you're high reload. Don't play top, get better than the mid laner and take his role. That's right. And stick to Aurelia, pick another simple assassin that that uh, gives you a clear identity, like an Echo, like a Diana, something of that nature, and then play only solo queue. Mm. So you got a tough, you got a tough call to make. That's right. If you play this team, and you try to play champs that are good for top and mid, you try to play two roles, you will be in silver forever. Mm. No questions asked. No, qu- no, th- that that's not even an exaggeration. You will be in silver for years. The, uh, yeah, like I'm trying to think of an analogy for that question. It's sort of like saying, Curtis, like I got myself into like this room in this alleyway and like my feet and hands are tied up and the room's getting filled with water (laughs) and like, I'm going to drown, but like, how do I get out? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to come up with something similar, which was like, I'm I'm currently studying full time and have three kids and and a huge mortgage to pay off, (laughs) but I want to get three blocks in and, you know, and my wife's trying to divorce me and what should I do? You know, it's it's an impossible situation. (laughs) You're just going to have to make some sacrifices. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. And 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 I'm, I'm not saying this to beat you up. Man, and I just thought it was um, something that everyone can learn from. Sometimes there is no solution. Mm. Yeah, and, and we then, have to make sacrifices. In League, you're going to have to make sacrifices, yeah. unfortunately. And uh, the other aspect of it as well is that they, don't, they know the answer, but they don't want to like, hear They don't the want to accept reality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that is correct. Um, so I found that pretty funny. And the last thing I want to say here, and this is more of a bit of a rant, um, which I, it just pisses me off. There are always these videos and discussions and things I get linked. Riot's pl- this one, this video was called Riot's Plan to Fix League of Legends. Oh, no. And I just get sick. I'm really sick of this. I'm S- sick of that too. I'm Stop angry. saying League is broken. Why does it need to be fixed? <laughs> yeah. Like, is it, this narrative going around that Riot is... You know, League of Legends, it's a broken game. It's just, it's it's screwed. It's broken. It's something's massively wrong with it. It's not a broken game. I don't know. I feel, Why is it broken? It feels like I'm not playing the same game as these people. Me, me, me too. It's I, I, not what my solo queue feels like at all. It's great. It's awesome. I don't know what the hell. The game has never been more competitive. No. It's never been more balanced. Mm. They've, they've answered so many problems. Mm. There's now... Anonymity in matchmaking. Switch roles. You get main role now more often. Yep. You can switch roles in cha- in the switch champ select. The positioning, yeah. You, um, they fix like the matchmaking is actually better quality now than it's ever been, right? Because it doesn't just it takes your MMR, not your rank. It's fixed so many aspects, and the game is pretty balanced. Mine, like they're gonna do a few minor patches, like fix Rise and Cassidy, fix Maokai, and the game's pretty bloody balanced. Mm. Think people think now the game is broken. Think about what it was like in season three. I mean, there's, all, there's always. I mean, we talked to and Proxon. it's never going to be perfect. We talked about Proxon about this. It's impossible to fully and you you actually don't you don't want, want a completely you don't want a completely game. balanced game. Yeah, that's right. It's not. And like, there's going to be strong and there's going to be weak champions, and you just keep cycling through them. And there's new metas, and the, that's just the way the game works. But remember, guys, that's, even if we're talking about champions, that's not the reason you're struggling to climb. There's so much going on. It just aggravates it, me. That it's like what aspect are they talking about? What are they broken? talking about? 
stop like it, we shouldn't start with the premise that league is broken like that's that's the, that's cuz that's where it's starting mm. the it, the underlying assumption is always that league is broken that it's a, it's like it's it's somehow misshaped and just ruined and now we need to fix it right we need to fix it permanently there's like this crazy like solution that like, like yeah sure there's always this. ways to make the game better don't get me wrong but like i just hate the frame of it and it's just aggravating and and you look at the way these people interact with the game like look at their it's relationship with the game it's yeah. like spamming games yeah. multiple accounts no chance every, mastery, every role my, blaming teammates it's like it's and this ties into like you know, people in, 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 you know, we talk about get your real life situation sorted before you complain about other people. Are you sleeping eight hours? Are you eating healthy? Are you working out? Are you, you know, pushing yourself and, and hold it, taking responsibility before you complain about society at large, <laughs> right? It's just a basic, it's like human 101. Yep. For league, as a jungle perspective, are you, is it a good gang? Is it a bad gang? Book your decisions, get specific. Path into the right lane, plan around your mid game. Where's my team? Where's the enemy team? Guys, I've reviewed games in, across all ELOs. And These we can't ignore this. The, the reason I'm ranting is because these are huge videos. Like, oh, really? This is like big shit. Like, this is like, this is like Reddit and b getting YouTube recommended hundreds of thousands of views and shit. Yeah, it's definitely the core narrative. And that's, again, that's Aggravate. a part of what we're doing with the, the break. Is, yeah, this is our fuel, dude. This is the rocket fuel of our BBC podcast. Yep. Like seeing these videos. And like, now expanding to the entire community, you know, working with players under gold now. Under gold as well. That's right. To help fix all those narratives. Exciting times ahead, Nathan. This year. All right, so should we jump into mailbag? Yep. Away we go. All right, first question here is from Carter. Title of this email is Built My First Ever Toolkit slash Solo Q Contracts. Um, hello, Curtis and Nathan. My name is Carter. I am a student of Cupcake, and my goal is to one, represent his students well here, as it seems most questions are from MLA and Soul 2, and two, become a regular name up there with the greats in the podcast, such as Patrick. Uh, he's actually written in before. Um, this will be more of a message of what you guys have helped me accomplish so far, not really a question. After season 12 ended, I was really disappointed in where I ended up. Plat 4 for the third season in a row. And I basically only went up 20 LP compared to last year. I decided to take a step back and really try to look at my problems, as in my mind, this was rock bottom. Before this point, I had watched a couple of Curtis's videos and a few of Cupcakes, but I didn't really watch the podcast. I think it intimidated me. I'm so glad, but I'm so glad I got into it. You guys are awesome role models, and I legit did not think there were people out there who also thought League is an amazing game and are so passionate about it. Anyways, I spent my preseason grinding out podcasts, episodes, and consumed more Cupcake content. Also joined his uh, school of support. So here's what I picked up. Uh, that I didn't have during season 12 in the preseason. Number one, three blocks. I was a game spammer beforehand, but I've seen the light now. I get in at, at least one three block a day and two if I'm not busy. It's real interesting. Again, people that follow our content a lot, they don't actually do these things. No. They think it's, ah, sounds cool, but I'm fine with spamming yep. games. Like it's all good. It's worked for me in the past, yep. right? And again, it's only when they hit rock, rock, rock bottom. Yep. <laughs> well, we said that one episode, Pete. You got to let people hit rock bottom. That's sometimes. right. You just got to let them. And then they change. Number two, reviewing. That's the first time I've heard about that word. I've started to review my games right after I'm done. It gives me a break instead of insecuring, and I can see my minute progress on my learning objectives. Number three, solo queue journal. I've started a journal that call that I call my league notes that has the, the date, the block, and the champ I played. I write down things I can improve on, what I did well, and if I hit some of my key learning objectives. Number four, face check. I found that I would obsessively check face check in loading screen and in deaths. It may be lazy with my runes and I realized I was developing narratives of my teammates before the game even started. It I'm assuming like it's like a power or something, yeah. Like, yeah. I've deleted it and it's drastically improved my focus and taking responsibility. It's not about my teammates, but me and what I can do to learn. They are just passerbys in my journey. You know, we've already talked about that. 
Uh, five, LP. I was a results-based player instead of growth journey player, so I was very emotionally attached to my LP. I now have the tool of literally not looking. I get out of the game and cover my face just enough so I can't see the continue screen. Uh, this has helped tremendously in ranked anxiety I get sometimes when I go and win lost streaks. We've talked before about the, on the podcast about the no-look challenge, and we probably need to make this public, but remember there's some people in our communities that have like code hmm. that they have that usually just, you can't see it. Yeah, I'll have to, because I think it, would, it doesn't work on the new, um, oh, the new thing, client, so I'll have to patch. ask about that, yeah. But you can just cover like the, the, the screen. Yeah. Like it's the same place. No, what you time. do is you, you close the client when you're on a screen. You can't do that, or you can literally just cover it. Like, oh, yeah, it, it's, yeah. either just, work, yeah, really. Either work. It's probably quicker to cover it, right? That's right. Because you, you it's the same place every time. As long as you know where to cover yeah. it, you might mess it up the first few times, <laughs> yeah. but like, you'll get good at it. <laughs> Uh, number six, account hop in. During the middle of the season, I ditched my main account and made a smurf because I believe my main was doomed because of the MMR. Didn't help that people hired me, just told me to give me to just give and make a new one. I'm sure you guys can guess what happened next, but I was going great at first and started to slow down and realize I'm just going to end up in the same place. <laughs> I love that so much, dude. That happens all the time. And I always say there is nothing better for someone's journey. You basically have to do it. You have to play on a doomed, ruined account to break the narrative because I've fixed those accounts before. I don't think you, you've really... I mean, you've technically fixed it at the beginning of the season. You were 4 Yeah, I was, I was really, really... Yeah, I mean, that's not really that many games in the grand yeah, scheme of things, games, but like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've never used more than one account to climb, so I can't really comment. And finally, my solo queue contract. I hereby understand that I am playing for me and not for the sake of others. Yes. I know I cannot win every game. I understand that it's about learning and climbing will come on its own. I'll play to my utmost ability and continue to push forward following the process for personal growth. I will have fun and stay curious no matter the outcome. There is so much more. I want to keep it brief. With these tools, I feel prepared to take on the new season and problem solve my way out of it. Thank you guys again for the awesome content and good luck to everyone else on their journey. Amazing. Another person awesome. that's seen the light. Yep. We'll just kind of see how he goes. I mean, this is, it's all good in theory, yep. right? He needs to just execute, execute now. He's in the execution right. phase. So I'd love to hear back from him in, you know, a few months time. Get back to us in three months. Yep. So Let us know going. how it's been going. And then maybe the end of the first split, that'd be great. Yep. That would be a really good gauge to kind of see how the process goes. One piece of advice I would give to him is that a lot of this sounds great. But especially if you were a spammer, a tilter, new accounts, like it seems like he ticks a lot of like uh, boxes for bad habits. You, you, it's very unlikely you're going to go from zero to one hundred. That's right. Yeah, you should be. You're gonna. You're gonna relapse. You're gonna relapse. Yeah. So, so I would recommend, like, the key word I tell people is sustainability. What process for you feels sustainable? You want it to be challenging, but you don't want to be too challenging. The moment it becomes too challenging, you might be able to do it for a week or two, mm. three weeks maybe. It just will get, it will, it will become too much and you'll relapse and you'll say, screw it. I don't want to do this anymore. And then you'll just go back and, and go back to your bad habits. So I would rather you start slow and and kind of slowly add things into your arsenal rather than go from zero to a hundred. That, that's my personal opinion. You might feel confident or really inspired because he hit rock bottom and he really wants to change. So everyone's different. Yeah, there could that's be just, no going back, you know, at this point. That's right. But so, so that's just my word of advice. Sustainability. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You got to remember that. All right. Next one here is from Ryan. Title of this email is giving up on my dream. Gradians, champions of solo queue. I've recently discovered something about myself that may resonate with you or other listeners or the podcast. Over my life, I've never made many sacrifices to play and grind league. I constantly think about the game and anyone who knows uh, me probably associates me with it. I've always been drawn to league, but I could never put a finger on what drives me to get games in. Because I could never quantify my own motivation, I let others do it for me. My high school classmates, my family, and my friends were baffled by my dedication to the game as they couldn't accept league as a path of mastery. People were saying, oh, you just must be doing it for a scholarship was a remark I often heard. And I would say, yes, I'm doing it for a scholarship. However, I couldn't care less about the external motivation of money or college recruitment. I just wanted to play the game. Of course, some comments weren't as forgiving. Uh, my father spent the majority of my conscious life demeaning and degrading everything about me. League was no exception. At multiple points throughout my childhood, he would ban things I loved for years at a time. And I was extremely fearful of the same thing happening to League. I already wasn't allowed to play it, but if he caught me in a game, I'll be punished severely. 
to avoid his wrath, I latched onto the notion of playing league only for college and presented the idea to my parents. Even he couldn't argue with free money. All the pressure from those around me put a massive strain on my relationship with the game. I eventually had to convince myself what others had told me. I had to have an external motivation to play the game. This drained the fun out of the game. I was no longer playing just to practice and enjoy my progress, but to achieve a strict goal in an unrealistic time. When I first joined Soul2 in 2021, so yeah, Ryan's a long-term Soul2 member, I hopped into the practice dojo to talk to some of the other mem members and get their perspective on the Soul2 program. One of the first questions I asked was, so who wants to be a professional player? Everyone in that call said, no, not me. I was completely shocked. In my worldview, there had to be a shiny reward, title, prestige, or dollar amount attached to everything people do. If they don't play for the game for that, then why play? I was trapped deep in the narrative forced upon me, and this wake-up call was unfortunately ignored. I kept telling myself the only reason I would pay for coaching is if I wanted to go pro, so I committed. Uh, through half semesters and full breaks, I stalled my college progress with the false hopes of becoming a professional player from 2021 to 2023. I set unrealistic and looming deadlines for my rank. Although I was able to climb, I often feared the game. Every failure was another day I doubted myself. The pressure I put on myself took a serious toll on my mental health and steered me off the road to mastery. Although it has taken years of reflection, I've severed this toxic part of my past. I hope this story can help someone do the same. The sad part is I don't think I ever wanted to be a professional player. Reflecting on my dreams, I envisioned my name on the challenger ladder, but not on the roster of a team. I was living in a world of delusion. Before writing this, I was entirely convinced I'd left this dream behind. Now I am sure. To all who hear this, ask yourself, why do you play the game? Get as specific as possible. Don't lie to yourself as I did for so many years. All the best, Ryan. Wow, that's deep. Yeah. <clears throat> Very deep. So... I think that's like a certain type of person where I, in a way, I think that, that, I mean, it's, it's good and bad. It's like your mindset where like everything has to have a clear goal or value. Like, I think that's sort of just the nature of just an ambitious young kid in a way. Like, you know, you just want to waste time, you know, like everything has to have like an, but as you get older, you realize, you know, you see the beauty in things and you, you know, you realize the importance of hobbies and pushing yourself and challenging yourself. It's like, you know, it's like as simple as like going, like when we go to the gym, we're not trying to be professional. We're never going to make a cent from going to the gym, but it makes us feel good. And it, uh, yeah, it just makes us feel good. <laughs> what else is it to do? Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, we didn't, we, we theoretically wouldn't have to go as much or do as intensive a workout to be healthy individuals is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. If we purely wanted to do it for health benefits, we wouldn't have to do what we're doing right now. Yeah. Our routine is right? pretty hectic. Right. And, I, I see what you mean, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I ultimately, uh, ultimately, a lot of this is highly personal, though. You know, everyone wants to live their life very differently. There are people that are that hyper efficient. Every single yeah, thing every in my day thing has to be optimized, and there has to be some some and I resonate. Clear I've reward. been sim I've been in times in my life yeah. where I've been like that, um, and then you kind of realize that you know sometimes you can't explain why you want to do something. And it doesn't really have to have a monetary, it doesn't have to advance your career or make you more money or make you look better or for networking. It can just be because you like to do it. A lot of the time, like I'll sit back and I'll rewatch movies that I've seen before. It makes no, no sense. sense. I'm yeah. not getting any value. I'm not getting, a, I'm not becoming a better person. I'm not working on myself. I already know what the movie's about. I've already seen the movie before, yeah. <laughs> but I'll do it because I like it. I like the acting and yeah. I, I like the story and I like, that's it. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and same thing for people who read I, but fantasy you know, the, novels. The, the funny or, thing is, is though, I still think that there is value in that. Like, because like a certain movie makes me think a certain way or gives me new ideas or something But it's like not that. in the traditional sense, right? It's not like you're actively advancing your career or uh, making yourself more fit. Yeah, or, not, you know, obviously. Not yeah. in like a traditional sense. Yeah. Obviously you see it in, in a much more long-term esoteric way, but like... <laughs> yeah. it's hard it, to explain. But that's not... Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, no, but sometimes I will watch something that is probably going to give me zero value. Yeah. <laughs> like there are times where I'll just, just, you know, sit on, you know, have a beer and watch a Seinfeld episode. I'm not really going to, I'm not really <laughs> getting a more sophisticated view of life, right? Yeah. Okay. My, 
you know, going on this, I think that he raises a really good point. We say this all the time. You got to understand what you want to get out of your league experience. Mm. Is it a hobby? Do you just enjoy playing? You just genuinely love the concept of the game. That's good enough. If you love League of Legends, you find it an incredibly fun and enjoyable activity. That's a great reason to play the game. If you love the competitive aspect, that's another reason. You want to you you want to be able to um, play local tournaments with your friends or be win class with your friends. That's a great that's a great thing. It's a bonding exercise with your friends. That's another great reason. There are many many innumerable amount of reasons to play the game, and all of them are equally justified. It depends on your current situation and what you want to get out of your. It's a lifestyle choice at the end of the day, right? But. I think the one notion, and I think we have said this on a previous episode, I don't believe that being 110% efficient in your life is sustainable. It can be good for a period of time like as a young, 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 uh, young whippersnapper. Yeah, young whippersnapper. But at some point you're going to realize, okay, I'm going to have to relax, relax in some way, shape or form, whether it's playing a video game, whether it's reading a fantasy novel, whether it's watching Netflix, whether it's going out and having a drink with my friends. At some point, I'm going to do something that isn't for efficiency purposes. <laughs> yeah, for some direct result at the end of it. <laughs> That's just the reality. We all need a hobby. We all need an outlet. We all need something that gives us deep satisfaction because not everyone has the luxury of having a deeply fulfilling career. That's just a, that's just reality. Hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. So um, um, I'm glad that he came to, he was honest with himself. I mean, in such a beautiful, it seems like he did a hell of a lot of reflection. reflection absolutely. And He's a smart I, kid. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for him for, from reading that, uh, listening to that, sorry, because that is not an easy conclusion to come to. There's a lot of deep shit right there. And I think that there's a lot of people that would not come out of that and, um, and could live in the past and um, be a very negative person. Hmm. So props to him for really having the tough conversation with himself and that, Ties back to one of my favorite quotes from David Goggins. The most important conversation you're going to have is the one you have with yourself. Love it. Right? So, um, yeah. Props to Ryan. Does he still play the game or not? Uh, yeah. He still plays? Yeah, he still plays. He's still in Solitary. Oh, cool. Um, the, the thing as well that I'll mention... Yeah, so he got really good results. He joined as like a platinum... I think low platinum player. Mm. And he got to master tier. Mm. Um, so, you know, he sort of like could see it. He could see know? the light see the light and we talked a lot about it like us you know sort of pushing but you know we always talk about going professional in league of legends oh. is very 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 difficult <laughs> it is unbelievable i'm pretty sure the stats are it's harder to become an mb it's harder to become a league pro player than an nba and an nfl player yeah, because it's right. even less spots there's less spots yeah it's incredibly difficult and the path to get there is less clear yes that's right comparatively to a traditional sport yep. yeah um I, I, what I tell people, I've, I've had people email me and they say, Curtis, I want to join the Midland Academy. I'm a 15 year old kid and I want to go pro. Every time I get one of those emails, I'm extremely conflicted mm. because on one hand, you yes. encourage them. Well, on one hand, I, I, I know that I can help them. Yeah. And I do feel like it's a great program to join if you want to push yourself and genuinely get better at the game. I feel like there's no other better place to be. At the same time, I have, I am yet to meet an individual that is said that early on that I want to go pro and actually get even remotely close. Mm. The only clients that have even got remotely close and got into minor leagues, ERL, you know, academy leagues, whatever, were already high ELO. They were already master yep. or grandmaster. Yep. I it mean, even for me, for Will, Will was like diamond one master when I started they're, working. They're basically them. already, they, 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 I, I am now, my mindset is, you should not even think about going pro until you've already got to master. Yeah, that's right. That's just that's just is a reality of the situation. It can be like it's like oh maybe I mean it's an it's it's in the realm of possibility, and you're kind of chilling and you're you're playing games and it's a passion and you know whatever. And if you happen to get to master tier in a re reasonable time frame while you're still young, then yeah, then it's something you could pursue. Like if if a if a sixteen year old kid who come to me who is master tier says i want to go pro i will go all out like i will help them and i'll get them with a the schedule and I'll, I'll do what i can because that that is you know that's a good chance you know they've actually got a good shot um but it's very different for if you're 16 and platinum four <laughs> you know it's a very 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 different yeah all right uh last one we'll do here this is from luke title of this email is above average at everything excellent at nothing 
Hello, Nathan and Kurz and fellow BBCs. Thanks for producing this podcast. It has helped my relationship with the game and my overall approach to improving immensely. In just about everything I've done in life, I've been above average in school, from grade school all the way to graduating college. I've been in the top 10% of my class in athletics. I've always been competitive. I'm a talented musician with the ability to play several instruments better than almost every musician I know. And in league, I'm at the perfect rank to be considered above average platinum four. I've been really reflect, reflect on how to break past this above average level, and I truly believe that's the purpose of my league journey. I don't think it's an issue of work. I'm able to follow a process and play nearly a thousand games in a season. I put in the work reviewing and I own my mistakes, but I still haven't been able to break out of Platinum 4. I'm hoping to make it happen this year and begin my path to Masters, or as I think of it, objective excellence at League of Legends. I would love any thoughts you guys have. I will say one idea I have is that being above average is comfortable because of the lack of social criticism. As a Platinum 4 player, I'm better than all my friends. So no one pushes me or criticizes me. As a musician, I'm better than all my friends and family. So no one looks down on me. As a student, my parents weren't having uncomfortable conversations with me because I had straight A's. I think that the comfort in my social standing holds me back. The first thing that comes to my mind is that I am so worried for him. <laughs> yeah. I am is shit scared. What, is that your first thought? Yeah, I am. I am straight like, A student kids. That's great. Is it music? Because I see so many aspects of him in me. Yeah. Like, I, I see so many aspects of him. In, what's the way? If me and him, sorry. Yeah. That it's concerning. And, and it, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but like, whenever I hear, because I was growing up you know, in similar, not, not to that degree. Right. I mean, I couldn't play multiple instruments. I don't, you know, but I would say for me, I was like above average at like things that I did and no matter what I did and, and gaming, I was good. I was excellent actually at every game I touched. Excellent. Not just above average. I was excellent in every game. The high rank at the game. highest rank of every game I played. Yep. Right. And that messed me up because I felt like I was special and I felt like I didn't, I felt like I, in a way, it was kind of expected that whatever I did, I would be the, basically could get to the highest level at. And that manifested in an incredibly fixed mindset. And it, and it prevented me from really fully internalizing process and growth mindset. And I genuinely believe that everything was talent, everything. And um, it took me literally years and years and years and years and years to undo that. And I, whenever I hear stories like this of people that write in about, you know, this situation and they're good, I'm like, it's much easier to work with someone that is a failure in every area. <laughs> that was me. Like you. And, and cause it's, you can, you, they're so much easier to work with because they just have, they've managed expectations and they, it's easier to adopt a growth mindset. And so, uh, the first thing I would suggest right now is that whether, whether it's it needs, you need to pick one thing. It doesn't even have to be league. It can be league if you want it to be league. But one thing that you need to stick to a process and push through. And if it is league, then great. Then in which case, stick to a role. Pick a role. Pick a champ pool. If you're in plat, three champs. If you want it to be three, it could even be two for now. Two or three. And get three blocking. Get reviewing. Um, and have a crack and hold. And, and then the thing that's going to happen is that you're not really going to go anywhere for the start, right? He's going to still be the same rank, similar rank. And then months might go by. He might still not, might, you likely might not get results, right? Because he never, maybe not, he's not, maybe he's not getting coaching, whatever. Still might not get results yet. At that point, this is where things are going to get tough. Every part of him is going to want to give up. Because why would he? Why would he persist? Why would he? He's not getting pushed by any external force. There's no reason. There's no incentive, like no outside external uh, incentive for him to keep going. He's already better than his friends. For him to compare himself to people that are higher him is going to hurt his ego. And so, what's he going to do? His every instinct is going to be to want to give up. Say, oh, league, uh, this is not for me. I'm already good enough. That's what he's into. That's what his subconscious will say. So my advice is don't give up. That's really as simple as that. Process and don't give up. Even if it takes you two years, three years to get to master, 
don't give up because I've had clients in similar positions to you that have given up so close and they are the most, they're the ones that make me the most sad. Even though I know they're never going to go pro, that but just, they've set a goal to get to master and they give up at D2 or something or mm. D3. Mm. They're the most sad clients and I feel so bad for them because what's that message sending them subconsciously that I can't do it. I need to, talent, it's all talent. So my gives is don't give up. And, and again, sustainability. He's he's probably got that, he's going to push harder, right? He's got that, he's probably got really good work ethic. He's going to like push harder in a way. He's like, oh, I got a thousand games a year. I'm going to do 2,000 games a year. And it can get out of control because he's, exp and I reckon he'll expect, if he hasn't vocalized it here already subconsciously, that he'll expect he'll get it in a relatively short time frame. Because he will finally commit to it. That's right. Because because this is the thing. And this is what hurt me the most. And it really put it very simply. I never fully gave my all in anything that I did because I fundamentally believe I, I, I wanted that defense mechanism. I wanted that layer of protection. Of never really trying to push or like study extra or whatever. And that always made me second or third. Mm. In OPL and when we play pro as a team, it was always comfortably second or third. Mm. And I would always give myself a pat on the back. Second or third, that's okay. They're different. They're, ta they're, they're talented. They're special. <laughs> That, and I would never even begin to compare myself with those people. Mm. But I just didn't push myself. No. Because you wouldn't have to have that tough conversation with yourself. If you push yourself when you fail, that is the hardest thing to deal with. And he's with. probably never done that. No. He's probably never pushed himself and failed. Because that's what's going to happen. He's going to push himself. He's not going to get master tier in this season. Highly unlikely. I'm not going to say he's not, but it's highly, highly, highly unlikely. And then... He's going to fail. Then what then? You've then stripped yourself of the, your protection, your layer of protection. And then, then what are you going to do? Most people either give up, they go to something different, or they have a hissy fit, whatever the hell it is, right? Some defense mechanism. So this is what I'm scared. This is what I'm, that's terrifying, you know, this, this can this okay. can go This can go many different ways. Yeah. Because I see so much of him in myself, of him in, in me. Well, I can't really relate because I was not good at anything in school. Um, my thing that I'll say is that um, uh, he says he's a student. So I'm guessing he's like 17, 18 yeah, years old, yeah. right? So obviously we've touched a lot on about league. And yes, you can get really good at league at a, a young age, right? For sure. Um, going back to always one of my favorite things is going back to time. Mm. Like, dude, you're 17, 18 years old. Like unless you're like literally a prodigy, if you're a musician, right? Like, I don't think you're going to be really good for another like, you know, 15, 20 years of chipping away at your craft. Like you're 70 years old, chill out, dude. You're not going to be really, really good at anything. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. It takes decades uh. to build mastery. Duro Dreams of Sushi. That is Have my a respect favorite documentary of no one respects time more than Duro Dreams of Sushi. This guy spent 60 years, 60 years. perfecting sushi. 20 years perfecting rice, 20 years perfecting another thing, like and 20 year blocks. 20 year blocks, dude, you're 17 years old, dude. You've barely started life. Yeah, so like, yeah, that's right. get into perspective as well. If you're above it, X or nothing, that will come with time. Yeah. Yeah. I just, all I want for this, I, I, and I, because I care so much about this guy, like just, just this story, because I really want to, I really don't want him to make the same mistakes as me. Is like, just please have a respect for the growth mindset, for the process and get, expose yourself, be put yourself in uncomfortable situations, do shit where you're actively bad at it mm. and then keep going. Yeah. And that is when you'll really get the most out of it. If he keeps going and we get a message two years later saying, I finally reached master, I will be so happy. That's so exciting. <laughs> right? I'll be so happy. Because what he would have got from that two years is immeasurable from a men like mentality perspective that he can apply to whatever he does in any industry and in any anything that he ever applies himself to. That's 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 what that's the, how to get real value from League of Legends. That's how the younger generation will get a lot of value from League of Legends. That's how to get have fun with a game as a hobby and get an immense amount of value that will help you long term in your life. And this perfect wrap up this why we are now expanding to the entire community. That's right. What you just said right there, because the game is so good, guys. Imagine, imagine, imagine if like this guy never did anything difficult and then he just did the things that he was comfortable with and never 
never had a medium in which he could push himself to that next level and just see what he's capable of and, and get exposed. <laughs> get exposed where it's like, this shit is hard yep. and I'm going to have to really get into the details. Lee here. exposes you, man. That's what I love about the game. And because it's fun and that's what it get, it gets us into that. It's something we're going to do anyway for a hobby. Let's just make a hobby something that's tough. That's tough, you know? yeah. It's fun, dude. It's fun and tough. So, yeah, I hope that helps. That's my advice. Stick to the process and just grind for years. Yeah. All right. Good way to end the podcast. Again, go to our websites. Sign up to the wait list. Link in the description below. 30 people. You, if you want to be a test dummy, now's the time. Elaborate. We'll see you next week, guys.